Welcome to Podcast 83, a regular look at the news, stories, and trends related to Michigan's 83 counties from the Michigan Association of Counties. Brought to you in part by Comcast, bringing the power of the internet into Michigan homes and businesses. Now, here's your host, MAC Executive Director Stephen Curry. Welcome, everyone. This is Podcast 83, put on by the Michigan Association of Counties. Um, And this week, we are missing our fearless leader, Steve Curry. Um, He had a prior obligation and is not going to be able to join us. But I think Megan and I can cover it. We'll we'll hold the fort down. Um, So great to see everyone. Hope you had a great holiday weekend. I apologize if anyone is actually experiencing snow like we are right now. So crazy. Terrible. And then it's supposed to be mid 70s by the end of the week. This is why we love Michigan. Why right? are we surprised? It's Michigan. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I have no idea why we're surprised. A little, a little frustrated, but not surprised. Um, so this week, we've just got a couple of things we want to run over with you. Um, I'm going to let Megan start out by talking about money, though, because hers is way more interesting than my update for this week. Um, so, Megan, you want to talk a little bit about House subcommittee budget, budget process, what the Senate's up to? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, hopefully, folks saw our legislative update last week because it had a whole list of some line items in there. Um, but I'll go over a few, a few uh, important items here. Not that everything's not important, but I'll just highlight a few, a few of the top line things, I suppose. Um, but you know, last week was the first week that the House and the Senate were back from their two week um, spring break. Uh, I think they like to call it in district work period. Um, and they started really moving and, and having a, a number of House appropriations subcommittees meet and um, start sending out recommendations to then the full House appropriations committee. Um, so they'll do that in both chambers. This week, I expect that the Senate subcommittees start to really meet and move their bills out with some of their initial recommendations. Um, you know, some things that are aligned with what the executive budget recommendation was, some that are not, some that have different strings attached to it. Um, and so that process is really starting. And so what came out of the House subcommittees last week was a whole host of a lot of public safety dollars at stake, um, some that are just state general funds, some that are from the federal state and local uh, recovery act that's through that ARPA money. And so um, the, the two larger budgets from the house side that we haven't seen come out yet and I expect to come next week are the DHHS budget and the general government budget. Um, but other than that, you know, we've seen a lot of movement. Um, particularly $149 million for the Indigent Defense Commission grants. So that's in line with what the governor had recommended. Um, this week, the Senate committee uh, subcommittee will be meeting and, and uh, fingers crossed that that number is also in their recommendation to make sure that those grants are fully funded for our, our counties that are uh, approving or submitting for those standards. There was also out of the House subcommittees, $175 million for a, a judicial case management system. This was really a large item that the, um, the State Court Administrative Office and the Michigan Supreme Court has been looking looking for and has been working with the judiciary. Just Sorry, if you don't mind, you're in. Um, Gladwin County. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you. Um, and so that recommendation came out of the judiciary budget and is something that the trial court funding commission recommendation included, um, back in 2019. And so this is kind of, you know, the, hopefully, uh, from the house side, the funds to support that. And, uh, we will probably see this week what the Senate will recommend for it. Um, one other important piece is the 15 million that was in the MSP, uh, recommend, subcommittee recommendation for secondary road patrol. So earlier this year, we saw some policy bills that have been moving to essentially shift away from that fund being um, 
all that revenue and that fund, fund coming from tickets that are generated. And so what this really does is shifts it to a more stable fund source through our liquor tax revenue that goes to the general, general fund of the state right now. And it takes 15 million and allocates that to the secondary road patrol uh, fund. So it's a more stable fund source. Um, essentially you have these policy bills moving, they moved through the house and now sitting in the Senate to make sure that the statute aligns with that idea. And then also the budget would reflect that funding as well. So um, hopefully that all comes together nicely, but of course something that needs to be um, flushed out through the, through the Senate committee process. And of course, something that the Senate House and um, governor all need to make sure that they agree on. A couple other um, key items that we always try to track is um, 4 million for our county veteran service grant program. That's something that started back in 2018 where counties get 50,000 base uh, for their veteran service grants. And then they can get additional amounts over that depending on their veteran population. And so that's been fully funded now for, for 4 million um, or $4 million is what we think is kind of fully funding that program um, and what we've seen in the past. So that's that's exciting news that that continues as well. I know there's been a lot of good work done since it started a few years back. Um, and then some additional funds through, through um, the federal dollars that the states received for local um, law enforcement reimbursement if they were required to use any uh, leave time to quarantine because of exposure to COVID-19. There's 10 million in there for that. 10 million in grant retention bonuses um, for, you know, to get grants for local um, off, local law enforcement offices to help attract and, and retain public safety officers, responders, uh, 911 dispatch um, staff, um, juvenile detention employees, the list goes on and we wanted to make sure it was really encompassing of all of those different areas that, um, that weren't necessarily included in what we've seen in a supplemental bill uh, the past, I think this past December, the House had recommended some supplemental spending on that. And it was, you know, I'd got a lot of calls from members saying, well, what about our local corrections officers? And what about our juvenile detention officers? And um, so that's all included now in what the fiscal year 23 recommendation would be uh, from the House perspective. So a whole host of things, please go to our legislative update and there's Definitely more on there if you have any specific questions on, um, you know, boilerplate language or requirements of some of these dollars, please feel free to reach out and just know this is kind of the first step in only one of the, the chambers, right? So we have the House sending this recommendation to their full appropriations committee. The Senate's about to do the same. I expect a lot of changes in all of this along the way. So uh, reach out with any questions, but always know that um, there's room for change, there's room for, um, there, or there's likely going to be change while these chambers come together and the governor's office has their input as well. Yeah, I think, you know, what, what we're under, to understand is that the budgets are going to be very different. So it's going to be, like Megan said, a while before they're finalized, but we do expect them to be significantly different, the House version versus the Senate version. Um, and again, as Megan said, the general government budget, which has your revenue sharing line item in it, has not been moved out of the House subcommittee yet, nor has it come out of the Senate subcommittees. They're going to be working on those for the next couple of weeks and trying to kick them out. Um, the governor had recommended a 5% increase in our ongoing revenue sharing at a 5% one dime. Um, that is something that we're still advocating for, so trying to make sure that it stays in the budget. But if you're talking to anyone back in the district, please make sure that you mention that to them so that we can continue that. Um, all right, I'm going to switch gears a little bit, and I want to talk about the House uh, Oversight Committee taking up a package of FOIA bills. Um, so they have a six-bill package amending the Freedom of Information Act. And they're trying to do some things that really are not going to be workable for local units of government. Some of the things in those bills are easy. We can define what a work day is or what a work week is. You have to respond to a FOIA request within five days. They want to define what a work day is. So anything but holiday, Monday through Friday, except for holidays. That's not so bad. Um, they would like the name and contact information of your FOIA coordinator posted online. Eh. 
okay, hopefully somebody's not on maternity leave, but yeah, got it. Um, some of the other things though in those bills are a little too much for us to be able to swallow. Um, Representative Johnson, who is chair of the committee and really kind of leading the charge on this FOIA legislation, has a bill that says whatever you use, whatever reason you use to deny a FOIA request is the only reason you can use if you're challenged later. So you're not going to be allowed to change or to add additional reasons why you have denied a FOIA request. This to us is extremely problematic because you are either going to have to comply with it if you can't bring up any others, if, if, if that exemption wasn't actually correct. You may have to employ legal counsel to help you make that decision on what to use for you know, denying a FOIA request. Um, and then are we gonna be actually put in the position of having to release private information, things that are supposed to be exempt from FOIA? Will we be required to release those? Um, that in and of itself is very problematic. Um, another provision in this package of bills would require you to, if you're gonna deny a FOIA request, require you to acknowledge that you have the, the record or the document, and then provide an explanation of what that document is and says. Mm, that's gonna be problematic as well. Whether it be a legal opinion, it could be a sexual harassment investigation. It could be any other kind of law enforcement investigation. So having to number one, acknowledge that or um, give an explanation of it could, could prove difficult. Um, another, one more thing in there that I really wanna highlight, and that's for those that deny um, a waiver of a fee for documents that are considered to be of public interest or the, for the public good. Public good is not defined in the legislation at all. And I think that we're gonna run into a situation where the press is going to say, every bit of the documents in your possession are for the public good and that they should know about them. And if you are, then you will be prohibited from charging for those documents in that type of situation. So it was just the first hearing this week, only house bills, there are not duplicate bills in the Senate. Um, we've written a letter that explains all of our opposition to it. More information in the legislative update on that. Um, but if you want to call and talk about it, I'd be more than happy to have that conversation. Um, I do think that the bill sponsors are willing to talk a little bit more and work on it. Um, but it is, but it is pretty problematic. So with that, Megan, I think you were just going to touch on opioid. Are you touching opioid bills? I can't remember. Oh, yeah. So, um, you know, just heads up, we've been working with the Department of Health and Human Services. We launched um, kind of a partnership with them about a month or so ago. Um, they has been, they've been starting to do more specific webinars on certain, certain um, uh, prevention resources, response efforts related to the opioid epidemic. This week, they actually have a webinar on harm reduction that is April 19th. And so you can register. That's also in our legislative update that went out last week. Um, and I would encourage if obviously there's a lot of the, the discussion around opioid settlement funds going on right now. And so really, this is just a way to talk about best practices, services that are out there that you might not be familiar with. Um, and this is absolutely something that you can pass along to, um, you know, department heads or staff or, or, you know, if it's health department or CMH or someone that um, in your county has been leading efforts on certain opioid recovery uh, or response efforts. Um, this is something that's available to anyone and, and all that want to attend. Um, and then also there's uh, some bills that have been moving through the legislature, legislature, and it's really to ensure that Michigan is receiving their nearly $800 million worth of um, national settlement dollars. And so um, this would essentially ensure that number one, the state funds, not that what's going directly to the counties, um, is going to go to a fund specifically for opioid uh, response efforts and unlike what happened with the tobacco settlement where it kind of got um, 
used for other general fund activities not related to the response efforts to to tobacco use. Um, the bill sponsors are really adamant that it goes specifically to a fund that outlines what's basically in the settlement, just kind of codifying it and in law and, and saying, you know, these are the things that these dollars can be used for, as well as um, two bills that would essentially bar any future litigation by state or local units of government for these specific defendants. And um, the settlement requires that to ensure we get all of those incentive dollars that are available to get to that 800 million almost statewide that, that we're getting for um, the national settlement. So some things you know, that we absolutely support um, and hopefully those first checks will be coming out to the county soon. We're expecting probably first uh, payments in April to May. And then again, later this year, it'll be like probably closer to uh, July or August that that second payment will come. And then after that, just annu annually, uh, one time a year. All right. So that's all well, I have open to questions. Yeah, who's got questions? Oh, it looks like we have some chat. Like I, don't, in here. I don't see any questions in uh, the chat link right now. All right. Vaughn is very happy with us. Thank you very much, Vaughn. We appreciate that. Okay. Awesome. Wow. Well, short podcast today. That's because we don't have Steve on. He talks way too much. Just kidding. Just kidding. Okay. Well, thank you, everyone. Enjoy your week, and we will see you again next week. Take care. Bye. Thank you for listening to today's episode of Podcast 83, brought to you in part by Comcast, bringing the power of the internet into Michigan homes and businesses.